Well, good morning again, Mayfair Bible Church. I have here Stefan. Let's give it up for Stefan right here. And Caleb. Let's hear it for Caleb. All right, so they're going to go into the push-up position now with your knees up and halfway down, 90 degrees. A little farther down, Caleb. A little farther. There we go. All right. It's got to be Marine approved. So what we have here is pain induced in their bodies. They can start to feel it right now. No pain, no gain. Arnold Schwarzenegger said a long time ago, right? No pain, no gain. Or hasta la vista, right? And so one of my seminary profs said, no spiritual growth occurs without pain or suffering. I'm like, oh, wait, 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 you can't put your knee down yet. You keep, go back down, go back down. I heard that from Dr. Stanley Toussaint at Dallas Seminary, and I thought, what? I can't grow to be more like Jesus without (laughs) pain or suffering. Okay, come on, somebody cheer on Caleb here. You got to at least go halfway down there, something like that. (laughs) Stefan, I think we got a winner. I think we got a winner. Let's give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. So... What they felt, the burn, the pain in their muscles, is also part of growing to be more like Jesus Christ. Now, it may not happen if physical pain, although that might be involved in spiritual growth, but other kinds of pains. But our natural tendency goes along with what my brother, who actually has won a few medals for weightlifting. My brother Stephen said one morning, five in the morning, he was down there pushing iron in our basement. And I'm like, what are you doing? It's five in the morning. And he's, Well, everybody wants to be strong, Michael, but most people don't want the pain that produces the strength. So I immediately got down on the floor and started knocking out push-ups, you know? Like, he looked at me like, give me a break. I can do twice as many as you, Michael. Come on. Well, you know, I I, want to get strong. But our natural inclination is to run away from pain, from suffering, to seek relief, retreat, escape, to be a fugitive of problems and conflicts. Can I get an amen? Uh, That's our natural inclination. We don't like pain. We don't like suffering. When an obstacle, obstacle comes, a challenge comes, we want to exit that problem. And we will do whatever it takes to relieve ourselves from that pain or that suffering. Those kinds of pains can come from emotional crisis. It could be physical. It could be spiritual. It could be financial pain. All kinds of things, though, that God uses in the laboratory of our lives to make us more and more like Jesus Christ to grow spiritual muscle fiber. And yet, our natural inclination, though, is to dodge out of it, to retreat, to escape. Now, what I want us to think about this morning is what is God's roadmap? What is God's roadmap for being transformed for growth in Jesus Christ. Now, rebirth, we're going to talk about, that's a single moment occurrence, rebirth in Jesus Christ. But what about thereafter, the metamorphosis process, transformation, change to become more like Jesus Christ? What is God's roadmap for that? This is an important question for us us to ask because Barna and Gallup do all kinds of research, and all the best research evidence indicates that only 10% of professing Christians in America believe that they have experienced radical transformation in Jesus Christ. Whoa! Only 10%, that means 90% of people who believe in Jesus say, I profess that Jesus is my Savior. 90% of them do not believe they've experienced radical transformation in their walk with Jesus Christ. So why is this? Why is this? I I want us to move into a story, okay? Because stories embed truth like nothing else. That's why the Old Testament is full of stories that have truth deeply embedded in them. Truth that changes. And the New Testament, we see Jesus using parables and word pictures to communicate 
truth that transforms. The Apostle Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to use word pictures and analogies to communicate story, to communicate truth. And so I want you to enter with me into the story of an often breezed over character in the Bible. An often breezed over character in the Bible by the name of John Mark. John Mark. Now, John is his Hebrew name. Mark is his Greek name. He goes by either one. He has 10 passages in the New Testament that are just brief snapshots. We don't know a lot about John Mark. There is some extra biblical literature that mentions John Mark, John or Mark, or Mark also known as John or John Mark together. But these 10 short brief snapshots in the New Testament give us a picture of someone's transformation process through pain and suffering. But John Mark has a tendency, like you and like me, to do what? Run! to retreat, to escape. When the going gets tough, when the way gets difficult, when there's challenge, obstacles, suffering, pain involved, he wants to run off. He doesn't want to go through that pain. So I want to enter first into this section of John Mark. We're going to see three simple movements, rebirth, maturity, and development, how the development takes place, rebirth, maturity, development. The first passage is from Mark chapter 14, verses 49, 50, 51, 52, specifically verses 51, 52. I want you to see this passage with me. And so Jesus is saying here, and this is on the eve of his crucifixion, just before he would go to the cross for our salvation. It says, every day, he says, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. And they all left him and fled. Who's they? His disciples. They all left him and fled. A young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body, and they seized him, but he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. This is kind of embarrassing. Now, what is this? Now, there's some debate about whether this young man was John Mark or not, but most interpreters believe that this is John Mark. Now, this is in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, 49 to 52. And Mark, we'll find out later, John Mark was the man to author the Gospel according to Mark. He didn't actually label it kata Mark. He didn't label it according to Mark. He didn't label it that. It was all throughout church history, though. He was believed to be, and from the earliest point, everybody taught that he was the one who wrote the gospel. But Mark puts no reference to his name anywhere in the gospel of Mark. He doesn't say, I'm the author of such and such, you know. He doesn't say anything like that. Never in the story is his name embedded at all either, okay? Never is Mark saying anything about himself. His whole point is to point people to Jesus Christ and that they believe on Jesus. This is the gospel, the good news of Jesus that Mark would write down. And just to give a little teaser, Mark spent time with Peter, and Peter was the one who gave eyewitness account to Mark, and Mark would write down, inspired by the Holy Spirit, of what happened, what did Jesus say, what did Jesus do? But this story, this, this unidentified young man, though, most likely was John Mark. John Mark. And why was he there? Well, John Mark was from most likely a wealthy family. How do we know that? Well, there later on would be a church that would meet in his house, a gathering of believers. This is from Acts chapter 12, verse 12. It says that, that Mary, the mother of John Mark, had believers meeting in her home. Now, it's also believed that the Last Supper of Jesus and his, and his disciples took place in the house of John Mark's parents. So it was probably a spacious house with upper rooms, and Jesus and his disciples, I'm, I take it that they met there. And so at night, here's the, this story, embed yourself into this story, put the sandals on, okay, for a moment. So Jesus and his disciples having the Last Supper in his parents' house, John Mark is aware of the surroundings, and he's heard of this Jesus. He's probably heard Jesus' teaching, and he's probably seen some of Jesus' works. And so his parents have Jesus and his disciples 
celebrating that last Passover meal together, and then they get up. Now, at that time, it would have been late in the evening, and John Mark would have gone to bed. He would have taken off his outer outer cloak, his outer cloak, and he would have had underneath just a linen inner garment, his pajamas. He goes to bed, and then at some point during the night, and this is based on John Grasmick, who's a professor at Dallas Seminary. John Grasmick builds the scene this way, that at some point, perhaps, a servant heard about Judas's treachery, and he rushes back to this house, and John Mark hears of it, and John Mark rushes to Gethsemane to find out what is going on. He, he seems to have this courage. He's there, and he's in this scene, and, but he's there. He hurries out so fast that he doesn't put his outer cloak on. He's just got his pajamas on, one single piece linen cloth, and later... He's identified as someone who's been following Jesus and his disciples, and so these officials seize him, but he pulls free and goes streaking across Jerusalem in the middle of the night. It's pretty embarrassing. Why did John Mark add this? Well, the Holy Spirit guided him to write this little vignette here, little vignette. John Mark, he lived in a house with some wealth. Probably didn't have much need. Had a comfortable life, but heard good teaching, Jesus and the apostles. So later on, after this scenario, we arrive at Acts chapter 12. Turn with me to Acts chapter 12. To the next, there's 10 passages, as I've said, that talk about John Mark. If we added this one, it'd be the 11th. John Mark, Acts chapter 12. Here's the passage I mentioned in verse 12, and when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary. This is where Peter, he's been delivered from prison by a miracle of God. An angelic messenger arrives, his chains fall off. He ends up at what house? At the house of John Mark's mother. He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called John Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. She sees Peter, and she doesn't let him in. She's so overcome that she runs back to the people in the house, and what is their reaction? You are out of your mind! So they were in there praying for Peter's release, by the way. What faith, you know? God answers their prayer, and they say, the girls, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting. I love how realistic the word of God is about people's failings. It gives us hope, doesn't it? It's not sugar-coated. Not thousands of people running around with halos on their heads. These are normal people with faulty faith, and yet believing. Because of her joy, she did not open the gate. Verse 15, they said to her, you are out of your mind, but she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. Is anybody going to let me in? I just got out of prison, you know. Opened the door, and they saw him and were amazed. God answered their prayer. So then, so Peter and John Mark are in the same house. Later on, 1 Peter chapter 5 1 Peter chapter 5, turn with me there to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. We find this out about John Mark. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. It says this. She who is in Babylon, the speaking of the church in Rome... Peter's using code words for Rome here because the persecution is so hot at this time by the emperor Nero that he wouldn't say Rome outright because it could intensify persecution. So he says, the church, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son, Mark. That's John Mark. Peter uses the phrase, my son Mark, to indicate that John Mark was the spiritual son of Peter. That Peter, through the providence of God, was led to lead, guided John Mark to faith in Jesus Christ. Rebirth in Christ. Happens, occurs in a single moment. That's point number one. Rebirth in Christ. We're talking about reborn, right? Reborn. Rebirth in Christ occurs in a single moment in time. It, our justification, whereby we are declared right in God's sight by God's gift of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We put our full faith, our trust in Christ's death, 
burial, and resurrection. What he did for our sin so that we could be redeemed, restored back into relationship with God. So when we put our faith in Jesus, God looks at you. God looks at me. And he says, I see the righteousness of Christ. We're clothed with the righteousness, made right, enabled to be in relationship with God by God's grace, brought into his family. Now, we belong to the family of God. We're part of one household. We're in this body of Christ together. And so John Mark enters into this family, and everything changes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, which we've talked about in this Reborn series, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, look, the new has come. This is what happens when we put our faith in Jesus. Rebirth in Christ occurs in a single moment. And the heavens are opened with joy. The saints rejoice. The angels rejoice in heaven over one sinner who comes to repentance to turn from their sin and turn in faith to Jesus Christ and to that restored relationship with God. And so Peter is saying, this is later on in John Mark's story, but we find out John Mark was with Peter in Rome. Peter had led him to faith in Christ. Rebirth is a beautiful, beautiful, exciting thing, isn't it? I think of the moment that I saw this little flower bud, Everlyn, that's my daughter. That was just a day after she was born. Wide-eyed, she looked into my eyes. I looked into her eyes, and it was just love at first sight. She still melts my heart, and she can still get just about everything she wants from me because she bats her eyelashes, and that's just not fair. But that's what Everlyn Sarah looked like when she was a newborn baby. We rejoiced. We shouted with praise to God in thanks. And I'm sure that Peter rejoiced over John Mark's justification by faith in Jesus Christ. He rejoiced. They, the church praised God. They gave thanks to what God was doing. Go with me back to the book of Acts now. Acts chapter 12 again, verses 24-25. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking that Saul would be later called Paul, taking along with them, you see that? John, that is John Mark. So he leaves his mother's house. Presumably his father passed away because it only mentions his mother, Mary, who's not the Mary, the mother of Jesus. There are many, many women who were named Mary or Miriam back then. When they followed, fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. So, John Mark, some point in that storyline, he comes to trust in Christ by Peter's witness, and then he goes on mission with Paul and Barnabas. The Apostle Paul, the church planter, Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Well, we know from Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, that John Mark was cousin to Barnabas. So Barnabas and John Mark knew each other. They knew each other well as family. And I'm sure Barnabas rejoiced over John Mark being reborn in Jesus Christ. But, what's the deal? Rebirth in Christ occurs in a single moment, but maturity in Christ takes the process of a lifetime. Maturity in Christ takes the process of a lifetime, and that process often involves pain, often involves difficulty, challenge, obstacle, all kinds of different sorts of sufferings. So look with me in Acts chapter 13 now. Look at verse 5. They head off on their first missionary journey. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God. They were sent out from Antioch, the city and in the synagogues of the Jews, they went first to the Jewish synagogues, proclaiming the gospel, the word of God, and they also had John as their helper. Now, John is this pretty indescript sort of guy. He's a general helper. Good young guy. He's probably about 25 years old at this point. Hey, he's got a church meeting in the house of his mother. Peter's led him to faith in Christ. He's Barnabas' cousin. Let's take him along. He'll be a good helper. Fine young man. Right? Opportunity for growth. Well, I want you to take a look at this missionary trip here. So this is the first missionary journey of Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark. They head out of Antioch to 
Paphos, Cyprus, and they head to Pamphylia, Perga. But something happens there. Difficulty arises. Look later on in Acts chapter 13 with me. So, I, I'm so glad to see you flipping your pages in your Bible and tapping on your phone or your tablet to get into God's Word. That's, we're a Bible church here. Oh, this is a little bit of a Bible drill this morning, and it's good to get in God's Word, isn't it? Acts chapter 13. So look at verse 8. Some trouble arises, but Elymas, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. And then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos, right here, and to Perga, came to Perga and Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Hmm. Got a little heated. Environment grew hostile. It wasn't like going back to mama's house where nice Christians were there. Challenge arose. How do I know that it was for challenges or pain or suffering that John Mark deserted? Deserted his cousin Barnabas and Paul. Now, there are some hypotheses that we don't know specifically what particular occurrence caused John Mark to flee, but something happened. It could be the difficulty, the tensions just there before. We also know the first missionary journey would only get more difficult. You heard of these little towns, Lystra and Derby, Iconium? Some pretty rough stuff happened there, didn't it? Stoned, left for dead, all that kind of good stuff that happens on missionary trips. College students, you're heading on a missionary trip this summer, right? Some of you are. That's what you have to look forward to. Maybe. I don't know. Hmm. But a young man named Timothy became a disciple in one of those little towns, though. See what God does through pain and suffering. So turn with me now to Acts chapter 15. Here's the second step. So maturity in Christ takes the process of a lifetime, and that process involves pain, it involves challenge, it involves difficulty, it's not necessarily easy. They're getting ready to head on their second missionary journey now, verse 36 through 41 of Acts chapter 15. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted him, deserted them and Pamphylia, and had not gone with them to the work. Oh, he, he, he left us. He abandoned us. We were on that journey. We were there to lead people to faith in Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel in the synagogues, to plant churches. And he took off, Barnabas. I know that you are an encourager. I know that he's your cousin. But there ain't no way he's going with us on this trip. I'm not going to deal with that again. What happens? And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and left being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Rebirth in Christ occurs in a single moment. You put your faith, your trust into Jesus Christ, and you're reborn. You receive life from above. You're brought into union with God through Jesus Christ. You are in Christ, forever kept secure. But maturity in Christ takes the process of a lifetime. John Mark and Barnabas disappear from the record for a number of years here. If you line up the years, John Mark and Barnabas spent about two years together in that was intensive discipleship. It was mentoring. 
And then also in that time, we know that Peter went to Rome, to Babylon, and John Mark would join him there, as we saw in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. So about 10 years go by, and in that period of time, John Mark is discipled, mentored by the team that God has put in his life, Barnabas and Peter. And 10 years go by. Now, I love my little kids. I love Everlyn so much. I love Hudson so much. I love Carson so much. And I am so excited to not be changing Everlyn's diaper anymore. I'm so excited to not be changing Hudson's diaper anymore, right? You see, rebirth or birth is exciting. Birth is exciting. It's wonderful. But it'd be kind of awkward if I had to brush Everlyn's teeth on her wedding day. It'd be pretty awkward if I had to change Hudson's clothes or, or, or make his bed when he's getting ready to have his first job interview. I'm glad that they can do those things, right? They're maturing, but it takes the process. It takes pain. I remember trying to teach Evelyn how to brush her teeth, and she still prefers that I brush her teeth, by the way. None of you have had that experience, right? Like, but Daddy, I want you to brush my teeth. But I taught her how to brush her teeth, and she knows how to brush her teeth, and I'm excited that she's growing. I'm excited that she's growing. This past week, I was doing the dishes, and everybody else was asleep in our house, and in our foyer, I noticed these three little shoes. Hudson's shoe is really not all that small anymore because his feet have grown a lot in the last year. There's Everlyn's little shoe with her pretty little bow adorning the toe, and Carson, his little sneaker, kind of saying, hey, don't forget about me. I know I'm small, but I still need my diaper changed. (laughs) I got misty-eyed thinking how fast they are growing. It goes so fast. It seems like just a few months ago that Everlyn was a newborn in my arms, that Hudson was a toddler, Carson, newborn baby, but they're growing, and, and this little a ray in our foyer was shouting out a message. Hey, we're growing, Papa. Things are changing. Pretty soon Hudson's going to be in puberty. And they're going to be asking for the truck keys. That's why I keep an old truck that's 25 years old, by the way. <laughs> and they'll be off to college. They'll be getting married, Lord willing. And then they'll have little shoes by their foyer someday, by God's grace. And they'll know all of the pain of growth and maturity, leading other little minions along. It is a process, though. It's a hard, difficult process. It's challenging. John Mark's life was up and down. He had a tendency to run. There he put it in John and Mark chapter 14, and then he uh, deserted Barnabas and Paul on the first missionary journey. But people built into his life. They mentored him. They instilled the word into him. They taught him how to walk in step with the spirit. And change developed through the process of his lifetime. Things change in your life. Metamorphosis, transformation through the process of a lifetime. Development comes by God's grace. Through God's grace in his word. That's our guide. Through his spirit. That's the power that we have through God, his word, his spirit, and his people, his team. And John Mark had all of these things working, developing Christ-like character, courage, maturity, and wisdom in his life. It was painful. Had some missteps along the way. But Barnabas kept taking care of um, teaching, and Peter kept teaching, and others, even Paul. Think about this. The chronology of John Mark's story gets pretty interesting. Because Paul's first imprisonment in Rome, who do we find there? John Mark. Turn with me to Colossians, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. <clears throat> Bible drill. If you go to First and Second Thessalonians, you've gone too far. Philippians, Colossians, Colossians chapter 4. 
This is also indicated in Philemon, verse 24. Philemon, of course, is just one chapter, and Paul, in his first imprisonment, is writing to the church in Colossae, of which Philemon is a part. And what does he say? Verse 10 of Colossians, chapter 4. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin, Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. I'm sending John Mark on a mission to you, church at Colossae. Welcome him. Turn over to Philemon. It's one we can find here. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. It was good to memorize those in song form when I was a child. Verse 24. As do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. He's sending greetings from prison to the church in Colossae. And John Mark, the one whom Paul did not want with him anymore in his first imprisonment, he is now there ministering to Paul and ministering with Paul. This is extraordinary. After 10 years of development, maturity, the process, now he's continuing to grow. And the one who formerly didn't want have anything to do with him ends up there together, and they're ministering together. Isn't this extraordinary? It's by God's grace. Sometimes you might wonder, why would God choose a man like John Mark, a fugitive, a deserter, faulty, unfaithful at tough times? Well, the answer is, those are the only kind of people there are. We're all prone to deserting, turning our back, backing away, looking for escape, looking for retreat, and God's grace keeps pursuing us, keeps loving us, and through his word and his spirit and his people, he's doing his developing work of transformation in our lives. Don't lose hope. John Mark is all the kind of people there are, you're just like it, so am I. So am I. Many years ago now, let's see, that was about 13 years ago. Stephanie and I, no, it wasn't that long ago. Nine years ago, 10 years ago, we bought our first house in Trenton, Michigan. I was a youth pastor down in Metro Detroit. And this house was built in 1870. 1870. So do the math. That was just, you know, five years before that, Abraham Lincoln was president. This was an old, old house. And this house needed just about everything. Now, it was a pretty nice little house, though. Look at that. There's Hudson. He's about Carson's age there, maybe about two years old. And I'm thinking Everlyn was a newborn infant or Stephanie was pregnant with Everlyn. Stephanie's going to be embarrassed because I don't remember the details. <laughs> the house was beautiful. It had character, as old houses do. And the neighborhood had lots of character. The neighborhood was filled with old homes that had been restored, but this one hadn't been really restored. It had been semi-restored 40 years before we bought it, but it hadn't been fully restored ever, and it still had things from 1870. And so we purchased this house in that picture, it's our picture of a redemption, right? We are purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. Purchased God's very own possession that God the Father purchased us with the blood of his son Jesus Christ and then gives the church as a gift to his son Jesus Christ. We're part of that. We're bought with a price. We're not our own. We uh, belong to Jesus Christ. So we purchased this house it belonged to us, and then we needed to figure out what we were going to do to restore this house. And to restore this house involved a huge team of people. We could not do this alone. So my friend Jim was really good with drywall and replastering or tearing off old plaster that was falling off the wood lath and pulling out horsehair insulation and all kinds of things. And so he helped with a lot of mudding over old plaster or ripping that off and putting on new drywall. And, and Jim helped with other things, straightening doorways. And then my friend Dave, Dave helped day upon day upon day with electrical work. He was really good at that. He helped with plumbing things. And then Chris helped with our ancient 
hot water boiler heating system. We had those giant cast iron grates around our house, and they were leaking, and then the boiler wasn't working, and he was always helping us on that sort of thing. And then my friend Dennis and a friend of his came and helped me tile the bathrooms and gut mold out of walls and all kinds of things. And then my friend Jeff, he helped with more drywall and kitchen stuff. My dad helped install the dishwasher and other things and flooring. We had to put flooring in this house and rip up the old carpet. All these kinds of things were function uh, function together as a team. So it is with John Mark's life. We need team to develop into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We can't go it alone. Chip Ingram said, he's a pastor out on the West Coast, he said, Show me a Christian who's not engaged in authentic community, and I will show you a Christian who's not growing. No ifs, buts, or maybes. You can't grow outside of authentic community with other believers. Most of the calls to growth and to sanctification, the process of becoming more like Christ in the New Testament, most of those are phrased in second person plural. You all be sanctified. You all grow together, not just you individually. So the Christian life is not about me, the Bible, alone by myself. It's about all of us together, serving together, loving one another, using the Spirit-given gifts and the Word to work as a team so that together we become more like the Christ who saved us and redeemed us and who is in the process of restoring us through those means of grace. Development comes through God's grace in His Word, His Spirit, and his people at the team. The guide is his word. The power comes from his spirit. And the team is the people of God together. That's what's so beautiful about the local ecclesia, the local church. And we needed everybody to help us because I was never going to finish all that restoration work on our house alone. And about two days before we closed on the house, it was all done. You catch that? Yeah, we, we had to sell the house before. We never got to live in it fully restored. And we probably left some things to the future homeowners. But you and I need community. It's said that a butterfly transforms in a cocoon, but a Christian is transformed in community. John Mark's life showed all kinds of evidence of people building into him, loving him, taking care of him, discipling him, picking him up when he fell down, When he ran off, they kept encouraging him. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Here's the last snapshot we'll look at here. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11 says this. This is now Paul's second imprisonment context. And he says to his people, Timothy, and the church that Timothy was pastoring there in Ephesus, these words, Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. The one who had been the deserter, the fugitive, has matured and is still continuing to mature, and he's using his spirit given gifts. And Paul recognizes the value, the love at work. John Mark's life, the one who ran off, is now a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. But it's a process. It takes a team, his word, his spirit, those means of grace of God transforming our lives. I want you to listen to a story now with my friend Bo Kime. He's going to come up here and share his story, his story of transformation. And one thing you'll hear in Bo's story is that he couldn't go this alone. There were things that happened that were transformative. Bo Kime serves as one of our deacons. You can just get, we got helpers to get the chairs. Yeah, they're coming. That's all right. Yeah, that's all right. Bo, Bo serves as one of our deacons here. And I just first, Bo, I want to ask you, tell us about your life before Christ, the old life. You can just get out over here. Um, my old life was pretty... Thanks, guys. Pretty rough and tumble. Um, by 13, I was um, smoking a lot of marijuana, doing uh, a lot of things that adventurous and curious boys without any boundaries or good leadership do. Um, that carried on for 
quite some time until I found myself um, addicted to crack cocaine. Um, as a teenager, uh, living a life that was just dirty, um, depraved, lonely, oftentimes scary, mm. finding yourself um, in situations of your own making and not knowing if you're going to be able to get out of that situation. Mm. Um, and that's what my life was like uh, mm -hmm. before rebirth. Mm -hmm. And it was um, the death of my grandfather that is really the catalyst that uh, brought me to salvation. I had, um, was a Easter and Christmas type Christian, um, was in a youth group at a Lutheran church, but it was simply just to hang out with girls, to be honest with you. Um, nah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my grandfather got cancer um, when I was about 20 years old. And uh, he passed away a week after my 21st birthday. And uh, he had some people coming to his house uh, that he had worked with who were Christians. And uh, they were pouring into him. And um, he got reborn mm. shortly before he died. Mm. Praise and, God. Um, he asked uh, a couple of them to make a promise to him that, that they would see me um, turn my life around um, and uh, that I would meet Jesus. Mm. And uh, they did. They, they kept that promise. Uh, one of them worked at the um, mission, uh, Carriagetown, Kenny Lark. And, uh, man, what a, what a time. Mm. Uh, mm. So yeah, reborn at 21 out of uh, mm. a life riddled with drugs yeah. and crime. Yeah. So was that while you were at Carriagetown that God the Holy Spirit drew you to faith in Christ? Yeah, I had yeah. been there uh, three days. And a um, gentleman who was in the same predicament, in the same mm. lifestyle choice as mm. I was, he, um, mm. he laid the gospel out to me very, very mm. clearly. And I had always believed in God. Um, I, I believed I was going to heaven because I had been baptized um, when, I was, when I was a little kid. Mm. And it was very clear to me when he shared what Christ had done for us mm. and what that really meant. And there was no hesitation mm. whatsoever mm -hmm. at that moment. And um, yeah. it, it's funny that you use the 10%, 90% mm. thing because at, at that moment, I, I had honestly, I had felt a, um, a change. Um, but I, I don't think it was a change that was as profound mm. um, as some changes that happened later. Yeah, tell us um, about that, the, the maturity process yeah. of which you and I are not complete with yet. <laughs> right. yeah. Um, yeah, so, so those of you that know me well know that um, I'm pretty capricious. Uh, I have a tendency to um, be immature. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. Um, I'm, a, I'm a good time Charlie by nature. And um, I kind of thought that this salvation thing was going to be, you know, all roses. Mm -hmm. you, you make that change and, and God's going to make your life so much easier. And um, what I found was the pain got harder and harder mm -hmm. and harder. <laughs> and the circumstances seemed to get more dire. Um, <laughs> as time progressed, I'm the type of person who, if I can't do it, what's the point of even doing it, right? So, you know, why rely on, on God? And uh, I found myself um, at an aneurysm in the aortic root of my mm. heart. Mm. And um, that was a scary time. Mm. And uh, for a long time, I kind of just 
Uh, my wife tells me a, a, a lot that, you know, I'm, I'm like an ostrich and I just kind of bury my head in, in the sand. And that's, that's kind of true. Um, in a lot of ways, mm. that's, that's true. I, I go inward mm. um, instead of seeking out that community mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that God had made for us. And, and that's what happened um, at that time. And uh, yeah, fast forward eight, eight years, they say, oh, okay, it's time you, you need to have this taken care of mm. you know, right now. And uh, it was at that moment that I, I realized, you know, I, I'd been reborn and on the outside, I, I looked pretty good, but the inside of me mm. was still trying to do mm. things myself. And, and I found myself, um, much like the drugs, I, I couldn't get off of drugs on my own. Um, mm -hmm. As hard as I tried to ignore my problems with the aneurysm away, I, I, I could not do that yep. either. Yep. 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 And, um, I think I was developing reliance on him to yeah. this. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, you know, coming out on the other side of it, um, I'm grateful for the pain mm -hmm. because that's where the real lesson is. And, mm -hmm. and, and I'm glad that, that you talk um, about community like mm -hmm. that because we can't, we can't do that mm -hmm. on our own. The list of people who have mm -hmm. um, mentored me mm -hmm. right as first being saved, mm -hmm. um, all, all the time along. I, I, I mean, without guys like uh, uh, Pastor Dale in my mm -hmm. life, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mike Thomas, mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I would have mm -hmm. the willingness or even mm -hmm. the nerve to have gone forward. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So just don't discount mm -hmm. the pain that mm -hmm. makes us go because mm -hmm. it'll, it'll get you get you closer mm -hmm. to God. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing, Bo. Your story reminds me of this quote. You can hang up here with me. From John Newton, former slave trader, he wrote the song Amazing Grace. He said, I am not what I ought to be. We can all say that. I am not what I want to be. I'm not what I hope to be in another world that is in the glory to come, but still I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. By God's grace, would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me?